those are largely untapped uh, opportunities for academic medical centers to really grow their overall businesses, again, by leveraging the things that they're really good at and then taking those concepts and those uh, infrastructure um, assets and applying them to other parts of the organization to make themselves more attractive to community providers as one-stop shopping options. Thank you for listening to Value-Based Care Insights, a podcast by Lumina Health Partners. I'm your host, Shelley Chopra. The series is for healthcare leaders and organizations navigating the journey to value-based care and the ever-changing landscape of our healthcare industry. Our goal in the series is to bring to you disruptive success strategies for healthcare organizations, leveraging our experience and having worked with some of the industry top experts and thought leaders. And before we dive into today's episode, I'd like to invite you to leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and let us know what you think about the episode today or any other questions that might be top of your mind. In today's episode, my co-host and managing principal of the firm, Dan Marino, will continue his deep dive into the topic we started in the last episode, which is value-based care insights for academic medical centers. Dan, I was reflecting on the conversation we had with our guest in the last episode, and some of the questions that continue to be top of my mind are, when we think about what is the value prop, you know, how do we really create a burning platform for this change into a value-based care environment? It is indeed different for academic medical centers, as you would imagine for CINs or ACOs in journal. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I'll tell you. Um, academic organizations, academic medical centers are really struggling with trying to figure out where they play within the whole value-based care arena. You know, since we had our last podcast episode um, and we had talked with John Marin, he brought up some really interesting points from the legal side as to what organizations need to think about as they move into value-based care. But at the end of the day, it really comes down to identifying that value proposition. Um, I've had the opportunity just over the last couple of weeks to talk with a few leaders from different academic organizations across the country, and they're asking some tough questions, questions around, you know, should they even have a clinically integrated network? And, you know, they realize that they have to move into value-based care and contracting because of the payers, but really are, are struggling with understanding where they fit and how to take advantage of, say, their, their own specialty services and those types of things in in order to really position themselves well in value-based care. Absolutely. And, you know, once they they are able to define what is actually that value prop for their medical, academic medical center, then I think the next hurdle to cross is how do you create a buy-in and how do you align your faculty, your non-faculty employed, and even your community providers with this value proposition so you create an alignment and a shared buy-in and that is, of course, always the next challenge academic medical centers run into. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, if you recall, John Marin on our last meeting mentioned strategy really has to fit into three categories. It has to align the faculty of the mm-hmm. academic medical center, as well as then the non-faculty employed mm-hmm. and then the community. So if you start to bring all of them together you know, you, you then create your value-based care strategy. The problem though that you have is each of them have different focuses, right? So what's in it for the academics and how it benefits the academics is different than a non-academic and, you know, a community provider. And I think being able to create that common vision and creating the culture to support that common vision, you know, that, that's essentially important to the success. Well, at the heart of this change is a culture change. You have to really help the organization navigate through and You know, when I reflect back on the work we've been doing with academic medical centers, um, one of the things that jumps up to me is the the critical role of governance, of setting up the right governance structure that is going to help with the culture change, that is going to help with the shift, and that is going to ensure that alignment is maintained through this journey. So, you know, I think governance really becomes really, really important in this journey. Yeah, and I think it's an area that is, I, I don't think is given enough attention as you're mm-hmm. thinking about how to manage the strategy going forward. Well, really pleased today to have Brent Estes with us, Shelley. Brent is uh, a, a national leader, um, worked in a 
large healthcare system, academic system for quite some time, his tremendous amount of experience in moving AMCs forward under the whole value-based care um, strategy, you know, focusing on everything from governance to the payer contracts and so forth. Welcome, Brent. Thanks, Dan and Shelley. Happy to be here. I appreciate the opportunity to participate. So, Brent, you know, why don't you take us through a couple of your thoughts, right? We, you know, Shelly and I sort of talked about framing some of these issues and the challenges that AMCs have. And she brought up a good point, right? Establishing that burning platform, the value proposition. So what have you seen as far as, say, some of the models that are out there that AMCs, those that have been successful moving into value-based care, what are those models that they've used? Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, there's really not a one-size-fits-all solution for an academic medical center because, as you two know, in working with these organizations, if, you, if you've seen one, you've seen one. And so I think when you start talking about the different models that uh, an organization might use, uh, it really all depends on how they fit into their local market, what their internal governance structures are, to some degree even where the university is positioned relative to the clinical operations of the organization. So you kind of have to start by looking at all that and then figure out what the right you know, model would be. You know, I think for some academic medical centers, a clinically integrated yeah. network makes a lot of sense, you know, particularly if they're one of many academic medical centers in their market. And there's a lot of community-based providers that are deeply involved in value-based care, both with governmental payers and also with commercial payers. But if you have an AMC who's kind of more dominant in their market and they have a very aligned medical staff, maybe a CIN is not the best approach. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, if you just think about the structures of the AMC, they're specialty dominant, right? They're, they have a lot of specialty specialists, a lot of specialties across the AMC. They don't have as much primary care unless they were fortunate enough to really, you know, have that as a strategy a few years ago. Most of the time they're trying to figure out how to create that primary care alignment or that primary care strategy. So it's almost like they have to focus on their strengths, right? Focus on those clinical service lines, focus, focus on those specialty services as a way to almost to build that primary care network, if you will. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Dan. So academic medical centers should focus on what they're good at, and that typically is the complex care or specialty care. And that actually provides a great opportunity for them to reach out and partner with primary care-based organizations in the community who are going to have a need to refer patients under value-based care contracts. So in most markets and with most academic medical centers, you know, they get the patients that they're most in the, in the service areas they're most known for. But for a lot of academic medical centers, there's a big opportunity to narrow the referral funnel uh, with these primary care organizations. And so thinking about service line uh, ACOs and really doing clinical integration and kind of getting that infrastructure in place within the four walls of the academic medical center would make it much easier for community-based organizations to partner with them and um, drive more value to the overall relationship. You know, this past week, we did a webinar on academic, focus on academic medical centers and how they need to advance into um, value-based care. And one of the questions that came up was around how do, how do these clinical service lines, where do they need to start, right? And I sort of answered it around, well, hey, you know, focus on those three or four key service lines like cancer, like orthopedics, like women's health services that you're known for in the market and really expand on that. And I would think, you know, something like cancer, for instance, you could tap into the oncology care model, right? The OCM that's sponsored by the government as a really great mechanism to really expand the cancer service line, if you will, and almost create a brand out of that. And I think you did some of that work, right? Why don't you talk a little bit about what you've done with OCM and so forth? Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're right. Those specialty areas that the academics are known for are great places to start because not only do they have a great product that they can start with, but those are also typically the clinical areas that we're all going to see growth in down the road. So um, much more long-term opportunity focusing on those in those areas than some of the other uh, areas community-based providers might focus in. Uh, but I agree the oncology care model uh, program through CMS is a great one for academic medical centers to focus on because it allows you to kind of take your integrated cancer center and then get access and information about um, the total utilization of care for your patients, not just what you're doing for them in terms of treating their cancer, but their heart conditions or 
other things that they need. And so it's an opportunity for the oncologist to then bring other components of the faculty in to really get their arms around how do you deliver value across the board for patients. And not only will that give them a better product, it actually gives them an opportunity to generate revenue. Um, because right. my experience has been when you look at these you know, types of programs, if, if you focus on a patient who, only, who has cancer, where well, they might be going to one provider for care of that, but going to another provider for care of heart conditions. And so it is an opportunity to capture more of a patient's healthcare wallet. And um, for Medicare Advantage and other commercial programs, that, that's a great revenue enhancement opportunity. Yeah, and it really focuses the service line, in this case cancer, to clinically integrate across the service line. But I think what it also allows you to do, as well as you're kind of building all of these, you know, these new capabilities, it allows the clinical service line or the academic institution to start to brand themselves and almost to advance that into um, promoting that level of branding direct to employers, if you will, or even to payers, for instance, in, in, in kind of like a centers of excellence type of a model. And, you know, this, this whole concept around direct to employers, we're hearing more and more about this. I think the clinical service line model fits right into it. Absolutely. I think direct to employer contracting may be a little tougher in a lot of markets, but I think there are certainly opportunities for academic medical centers to be ACO partners with payers uh, for specialty service lines and not just for the patients that the AMC already takes care of, but AMCs can think about themselves as being the population manager for a population of patients for cancer or heart conditions that go beyond their own enterprise. They could actually be providing support services to the payers for patients that are consuming services in other healthcare systems. So huge, you know, care coordination opportunities, huge reputational enhancement opportunities, and big growth opportunities for AMCs in that space. Yeah, and I don't even think the AMCs really realize that. It's interesting, the ones that I've been speaking to, um, they're really not taking advantage of, I think, the role that they play in managing the community population, if you will. I mean, these AMCs, you know, they manage, you know, if they're, if you're a tertiary care environment, you're managing the most complex, right? So if you think about the risk pyramid, they're managing the top of the risk pyramid, the high complex patients, the patients that are most costly. And if they do that well, and they have the outcomes to show that, boy, they provide a tremendous amount of value to the overall management of these attributed populations, right? And I think the payers will, will definitely look to these organizations as being that kind of that guiding light, if you will, on how they need to really care for these sick of the sick. Exactly. And I think I've seen a, an openness on the part of many of the national payers in particular um, to really bring academic medical centers into their discussions about what quality metrics of the future should be. And I think one of the, when you talk about some of the challenges of academic medical centers embracing value-based care as we've seen it to this point, because you mentioned many of them are, are really heavily um, driven by specialty care and not primary care, they have a hard time sort of aligning around things that uh, commercial payers have typically focused on like diabetes care and hypertension, because that's not really what they think of first when they think about driving value um, out of the academic medical center. Um, But I think with the payers now being willing to kind of have academic medical centers who are already demonstrating a commitment to value-based care, whether that's through um, bundled payments with Medicare or oncology care model, to some degree, even transplant services with, you know, commercial payers and bundled payment arrangements. I think there's an opportunity for academic medical centers to reshape the definition of quality that then gets kind of pushed down into the employer community. But I agree, if you're able to do that, then I think academic medical centers can also benefit from greater stability in their payer relationships because there'll be more more codependency on developing those clinical programs and what people should be focusing on. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, one of the things that Shelly mentioned early on when we were talking, when we work with a lot of the academics, we really almost focus a, a considerable amount of time at the beginning around education and having conversations, say, with the dean, slightly different than the president of the practice plan, but really focusing on the same message, right? What's that value proposition? How do you move them forward? How do you create the right governance to to structure that? You know, what are some of the thoughts that you've had around governance? I know in the organization you worked on um, or worked with, you know, you, you focused a lot on governance models. 
Yeah, we did. And it really is important. And, you know, so I think, first of all, uh, you touched upon it. It really all starts at the top of the organization. So if the very senior leaders of the organization don't really believe that value-based care is the way things are going in healthcare, then there really is not much chance you're going to get the rest of the organization to move. Once you can overcome that, and I think you can in most academic medical center organizations, um, they would all recognize that at some point, you know, somebody in their market is going to do it. So there is a benefit to being an early adopter in some of these initiatives. But then you have to really kind of figure out what the right structure is for their particular situation. I think generally you want to have a person who's dedicated to uh, improving value-based care infrastructure and processes within the organization. And that person has to be obviously respected by their uh, you know, peers within the faculty plan or on the medical staff of the AMC. But I also think they have to have some real responsibilities and authorities in terms of being able to change things and get people to co- uh, coordinate their efforts and collaborate. So areas like social work and case management and discharge planning ought to all be working really closely together um, in order to make sure the transitions of care are done. And that's how you're able to focus on things like management of your post-acute care network and really being able to get people back into the offices when they need to. And it also feeds into readmissions programs and other inpatient management programs. So I think having an accountable person is really important. I also think that individual really um, should have uh, a good understanding of the local market with regard to the commercial payers and employers. They don't necessarily have to agree with what the payers say, But I think um, not dismissing what the payers are talking about in terms of what they're hearing from employers is an important uh, quality for that leader to have. Yeah, yeah. And and I I couldn't agree with you more. I think having that individual, somebody to be the point person, right, sort of carrying the VBC torch, if you will, I think is critical. I think second to that, as you mentioned, this person does have to have a good feel for the market, the market that they're, you know, they're living in, frankly, both in terms of the payers um, and how to connect with the community providers as well, too. And then coupled on or just adding to that, I think if they also could then have some good relationships with, you know, the business leaders and the community leaders, because as you said, you know, the academic institution, just their mission alone puts them in a different role um, as they're working with the community. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Couldn't agree more with the relationships with the community providers. And again, we touched upon it before, but I think those are those are largely untapped uh, opportunities for academic medical centers to really grow their overall businesses, again, by leveraging the things that they're really good at and then taking those concepts and those uh, infrastructure um, assets and applying them to other parts of the organization to make themselves more attractive to community providers as one stop shopping options. Right. Well, Brent, I, I think if, if we can wrap up a couple of things, if, um, if you were to give some advice to our listeners, and especially those that are living in the academic world, what would be the two or three piece of advice you know, that, that you would share with them as they're starting to really move the, their organization into one that's, that's focused a little bit more on value-based care? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it might be hard to come up with a couple, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, I think one is really t- tackle the cultural issues, you know, head on and make sure uh, head on and make sure you've got alignment at your most senior leadership level in terms of where your your market is going on value based care. And then from there, you know, engage your chairs and other clinical leaders to really help put together the right structure for your organization. So I think that would be probably the best place for people to start. And then I think, you know, go go to the market and ask what payers are wanting and talk to them about uh, how you're providing value to them today and what improvements you could make, you know, down the road. And for some academic medical centers, they have access to employers and others that don't. But for those that do, uh, use those relationships as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I think just really just building on that, just having these organizations focusing on what their strengths are and, and really how to create, position themselves as a differentiator in the market, right? Um You know, I think a lot of these organizations are trying to fit into one mold. And unfortunately, that mold is more community based, you know, CIN or value based care mold, as opposed to focusing on the strengths of the academics. Exactly. So, again, I I guess the third piece of advice would be really take a look at, you know, CMS programs that are available. We've already talked about oncology care model, but that really is a good a good example of how academic medical centers can really jump into value based care with little risk, but uh, a lot of opportunity to really improve internal processes to reduce operating costs, but also 
really improve care and drive revenue. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Well, Shelly, you know, Brent's brought up some great points. I know when we were talking early on, I think these struggles with where these organizations need to start, I think they're going to continue to struggle with this. Um, you know, and I know you've worked with a lot of senior leaders, too, as, as they're starting to move their their whole culture forward, their whole strategy forward. I think the governance model is going to be critical in, in making that happen. But I'd also love to see these organizations really thinking about how they can solve, you know, the population health problem, health, health management problem, really being able to think about where they fit, how they leverage it, and really where their big takeaways are, where their big strengths are. I think that val- that part of the value proposition becomes really important. I, I agree, Dan. And, you know, Brent, as you were talking, what prompted me was it's not about just defining and identifying the value prop, but also being prepared to be able to measure the value and the change and the impact you create as a result of those programs. So when you talk about governance being top-down, but then also keeping in mind, how do you monitor um, and how do you create that impact on the front lines? And I think what that brings me back to, you know, your comments on the governance and your comments on um, leveraging the marketing feedback is the need to also create a data infrastructure and analytics infrastructure, which is then going to help you to measure the impact and change through this population um, management programs that you put in place. Yeah, absolutely. You're completely right. And, you know, academic medical center, people love analytics and looking at the data. So, you know, for them, having that capability is going to be essential to carrying these, you know, initiatives on, because if you're not able to measure the return on these investments, then, you know, the efforts are going to fizzle out. So I couldn't agree more. That's a really critical part of the overall plan. I could definitely see us having a conversation at some point down the road, uh, probably sooner than later, on the real need for this level of data in an academic environment. That's a great point. Analytics becomes really important as a core infrastructure to to really measure the change and the impact that's implemented in this journey to value-based care. And in fact, that also happens to be our theme in April, which is to dive into successful strategies on how to put together an action-oriented analytics infrastructure that helps measure the return on investment the pace of change that is implemented or where you're not able to implement the change, but really making it very data specific. And that's the focus of our podcast episodes in April. We want to thank our listeners for tuning in to our value-based insights podcast by Lumina Health Partners. We at Lumina are your partners on the journey to value-based care. To learn more about us, visit us on luminahp.com. And if you found value in today's conversation, subscribe to us on all major podcast platforms, and don't forget to leave us feedback. You can also find additional blogs, thought leadership on this topic, and also transcript of our podcast episodes on our website, luminahp.com. Join us again next time, wherein Dan and I dive in further into analytic strategies for value-based care and how CINs, ACOs, and academic medical centers can leverage these strategies for sustainable success. Until then, have a great day.